Does voter fraud exist? I, I don't know for certain. Uh, are you an expert in voter fraud? No, I'm not. Well, why then is Twitter right now putting purported warnings on virtually any statement about voter fraud? We're simply linking to a broader conversation so that people have more information. We also uh, are considering full disclosure, a little bit of a preview, um, the notion of a curfew. Now, before you jump in terms of your mindset and whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, uh, we are assessing that as well. Yes, we have uh, Pastor Warnock and we have uh, Mr. Ossoff. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, that's great news. Okay, well, thanks so much, y'all. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye now. Whatever it takes. Holy Jesus. Steel Magnolias took a turn for the dark there. <laughs> Man, well, that was uh, that was actually an actor who's doing get out the vote calls from L.A. Making pretend that he is calling from uh, Georgia to make sure that the special election, the Senate election, uh, goes for the Democrats. Not bad. He wasn't. I enjoyed his acting, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know that it was necessary because he spoke to he was speaking to Democrats in Georgia on the phone already who apparently knew who the candidates were. I don't know that he needed to go into deep cover. He could just he could also just talk like somebody not from Georgia. I appreciate that. Well, but how else can he express his deep disdain for the voters mm. of Georgia, honey? Oh, you're suggesting that he was acting like a stupid redneck Democrat. Yeah. To show I apologize for interrupting you on the Lord's Day, he says in the video. Ooh, that's a great point. Little listen to he that. Hates, His... He hates Georgia idiots. That's Oh, that was my takeaway. Good afternoon. This is Megan from Alpharetta. I'm calling for Miss Petunia. So this guy is named Adrian Elliott. He is an actor. He is not from Georgia. He has no accent. He's talking to somebody, uh, some get out the vote movement. He's talking to somebody, voters, Democrats in Georgia, telling them to prepare to uh, make sure you're all up to date on the special election. Hey, Miss Petunia, how's the weather over there in Decatur? Oh, yes, it is lovely here today in Alpharetta. I'm so sorry to bother you on the Lord's Day, but I just wanted to make sure that y'all were all set up for our runoff election for Senate on January 5th. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, bless y'all. Yes. Yes, we have uh, Pastor Warnock and we have uh, Mr. Ossoff. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. That's great news. Okay. Well, thanks so much, y'all. Have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye now. Whatever it takes. So then the mask comes off at the end of this. Forever. <laughs> you know what? I would like to revise my opinion on this. One, there is nobody on the phone. Absolutely not. Yeah, no, definitely This is all not. about him. Hey, hello, Miss Petunia. What kind of name would the dumb rednecks have? Petunia, probably, right? I hey, hello, Miss Petunia. Petunia. It, it totally was. Um, what was the reference I, I came up with? It was great. Steel Magnolias. Mm -hmm. Did you see that movie, else? Mm -mm. You haven't seen I've Steel I've heard of it, though. You're missing like, as a reference. an important genre of movies. So... <sighs> When I was a young man, Alice, I was sentenced to working on a cruise <laughs> ship for um, almost a whole school year. And during that school year, in high school, mm -hmm. the the uh, cruise ship, which has since subsequently sunk, the cruise ship would play only a number of films that were out at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was a teenager, like 15, whatever. Shockingly enough... Uh, my dance card was not full of dates with the ladies. <laughs> and, and so a lot of times I would just, I was, uh, you know, actually this says a lot, actually. I was, uh, I would smoke cigarettes. When I ran out of cigarettes, i just find somebody's half-smoked cigarette butt and just smoke it. <laughs> like, like a hobo. I, yeah, like a hobo. Exactly. <laughs> Me and the hobos were fighting it out for cigarettes. And I would hate the ones with, uh. Lipstick, but you know, I was healthily addicted, so <laughs> I would whatever. In the movie theater, it had some of the best, best cigarettes uh, in the ashtrays. Mm -hmm. Jesus, maybe I should have thought about this before. <laughs> it's I've not never... a family friendly. Story. No, so anyway, so I would just grab anybody who's been addicted to smoking. You've you've done this with cigarettes, but I was pretty it's young. Not I'd... true. I, uh, I mean, okay. Anybody who's just uh, craving, <laughs> you've done this. So so anyway, I would I would just grab whatever cigarettes. I could. Sometimes you'd have one that was barely. Barely smoked for whatever reason. Oh, the your lucky day. Well, I think technically <laughs> the movie theater, you weren't allowed to smoke in the theater. So they were coming in and putting them out. So that was a score. Oh. If you're a theater 
if you're a theater uh, bottom feeding rat, <laughs> you should have seen the half eaten popcorn. I was lousy with popcorn <laughs> alone on a cruise ship where anybody else, you, mm-hmm. you know, who was you know a plausible human being was having a romantic, the romantic time of their life. But I worked in the cruise ship, and so this is. I mean, no judgment. As a person who routinely eats <clears throat> their kids' half eaten chicken nuggets as dinner, you know, I can't really cast judgment on this, but okay, continue. You should, but you can't. <laughs> that answers a lot of questions, probably for a lot of people watching. Um, so, so anyway, there were a few movies that were showing again and again and again. And oh, another thing about the movie theater was, other than, unlike the rest of the boat, it had exceptionally good air conditioning. Oh. So this boat's down in the Caribbean, and sometimes it's it's boiling hot. And my cabin, I had a loser cabin. Um, the cabins were all, the cabins were all, um, they were all divvied up by, um, how would I say this, race um, or nationality, certainly. So the Greeks had the best cabins because they were the officers. They were the king dinglings in the ship. <laughs> And then the English were the photogs, and they had pretty good. <laughs> what cruise company is this that hires this... people by race? Oh, I'm sure it, it back in the 80s it was everybody. I'm sure it still is. So the English were photogs. The, the mm-hmm. uh, Greeks were were they essentially ran the ship, even though most of the ships were registered out of Norway. Okay. And the Bangladeshis were housekeepers. Um, they had the worst cabins. And okay. the Irish had, um, and some of the Irish did, they didn't do what the English did, but they did something else. But I was an American photographer, and I was, uh, Americans did a lot of the shore excursion stuff. Oh, okay. So, you know, you, you'd speak to other fat Americans who were, <laughs> and tell them to rent. You could communicate with yes, them. Yes, so you'd tell them to rent scuba gear and do this. I was actually a ship's photographer. I was with the English technically, but since I was an American, <laughs> I was, this was all true. And then there were Asians. Asians were um, did housekeeping as well, but on different floors generally. Um, and a lot of um, Australians and New Zealanders were there as well, and they were bartenders when when I was there in F and B. And then the waiters were who uh, did like music and like. There's a lot of Irish and English in the music. Those so those uh-huh. acts were brought in. So when I was there, the uh, and this was the uh, you can look this ship up. This is the uh, SS Galileo, and. The SS it was Chandris Fantasy Cruises back in the eighties, late eighties, and so when I was there, the the act was an American act. Uh, the dancers were American, or at least it was an American dance dancer act. Mm-hmm. When I was there, they, they were doing a big Irving Berlin review, so okay. I got into that. I could do um, a Deep in Heart of Texas all day. <laughs> and uh, but the band was English Irish, the rock band. The musician, okay. the magician, was an American with a beautiful mm-hmm. wife. Um, and, and, but it broke out like that. And so if you were, none of the guys, the back of the house people could, were allowed to go up into the bars and talk to, talk to, um, the, the guests, the guests. Or- no, but I was, uh, an American and so I could go up there. We had special stuff to wear, suits mm-hmm. to wear up and we were allowed to speak to the guests because, you know, because, uh, there was a vicious, um, uh, caste system happening in this. <laughs> and uh so the americans are out there sometimes i'd eat with the greeks they'd invite us to eat mm-hmm. and um and in the captain's special dining room away mm. from the hoi um and um and uh but but the the thing is that actually and this is if you watch the movie titanic this is this is true about it is the best bar on the ship um was a bar in the in the very front is it the stern or the aft? I don't know. I probably the, should have known. Both the stern and no. the aft mean the back of the boat, I thought. No. Bow. Okay. Bow is. The bow is bow. the front. Okay. Then what's the other? What is. If the. How come the back has two names? Anyway. So there was a great bar in front, and this is a total hell hole in the front of the boat, way down, no air conditioning. It's hot as hell. All the beer was warm. But there was music and there was chorale. It was just great. And I was like 15. So to me, this was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> but it was a great, 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 great time. Um, and a great time. And, and, and you know, what, I was hanging out with these guys. And, and young guys, we'd go out in the town in Bermuda mm-hmm. and in other places if, for, who were my age or a little bit older. Because I, I think I was 15. 
They were 17 from England. Mm-hmm. I was a huge Beatles fan, and I met this kid from Liverpool, England, and he was a young a young guy of a photog as well. Mm-hmm. And I love them. And he was and he spoke just like he had a harsh little yeah. pool, pool accent. And so, but he spoke like the Beatles. He, he sounded probably more like George than anything. And I remember when I first American when I went from first American when I first met him, I said to like a, like William or whatever. I said to William, "How come you don't like me?" He just because he didn't like me. Believe it or not, he didn't like me. <laughs> You know, maybe because you were a super fan of his maybe accent. Cause, yeah, maybe because when he was like putting a cigarette out, I would grab it and pu- <laughs> force it into my pocket like it was a homeless person. But he said, because you're a fat American. In a perfect Liverpool with an accent, I was so thrilled that he spoke to me with that accent that I didn't like absorb pr- properly the insult. But he hung around with his fat American after a while. They We all got along. It was, and it was so great. And what a way to spend like seven months and – Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was great, too, to lose weight because, you know, we, we weren't allowed to take the elevator. So you're, if you're the crew, you've got to walk up the stairs. You know, t- ten flights, clink, 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 up and down and up and down and up. And down. It was just a blast. I mean, I was, it was just a great time. So, uh, and you learn a lot, a lot about people, a lot about people. We used to take through these cruises from New York, these weekend to nowhere cruises. Mm-hmm. So they were cheaper cruises, but the boats wanted to make money. We'd park right next to the... Uh, Intrepid, you know, the Fisher House people, Ken mm-hmm. Fisher, their, their aircraft carrier, the Intrepid in New York. But every time on these, on these, my, one of my jobs was to catch everybody trying to steal their pictures. Because so, you know, everybody gets on the boat, you know, and then when there's the captain's like a uh, cocktail party, you big smiles, everybody, and take pictures, take pictures of everybody eating and whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and back then th- you charge. You charge the hell out of them. Back then it was probably like 10 bucks, which seemed crazy. And so these people who were, Going on the weekend cruises, they didn't have any money to speak of. You know, these were like trashy cruises. <laughs> so they're like, screw this. So my job was to bust them taking, uh, taking pictures. And uh, anyway, just an in- incredible time. Speaking of that, my boss, uh, I used to order from this beautiful woman who was uh, from New Zealand. I used to order uh, Virgin Marys, Virgin Bloody Marys. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and she was so lovely. Her name was Melanie, I think. Mm-hmm. She was so lovely. And she had an, that accent, you know, like, would you like the chick? You know, I mean, would you like the check? You know, but mm-hmm. they say, chick and nick and it was just a great accent. And, of course, I fell in love with everybody. They're all older than me, and they all, they were, they were could care less, you know. Um, but anyway, the big guy, <laughs> it was crazy. So while I'm in my, I'm in the little photo area there, watching for photo stealers mm-hmm. melanie brings me the uh brings me my virgin mary the big boss of the picture company comes over big guy he's from um he's from um a place called gringley on the hill in england <laughs> is there a more british place i know name i in know the world? how gringley hogwartian was it oh, gringley on the hill and um and mm. he's like he Puts a cigarette out, throws it in my drink. So my drink was halfway gone. He just assumed that it was done, somebody else's drink, whatever. Throws a cigarette out, and he's like, uh, "Hey, mate, good to have you. It's gonna be great to have you here, whatever." I'm, I won't try to do the English accent because I, I can't seem to do it. So, so and and I, and I said, "Oh, great! And I'm intimidated. This is the big man, you know." Mm-hmm. They used to call them number one through five. So I, I, I was, I worked along the number fives. The number fours had been there like two years. The number threes could in a case of emergency <laughs> could could become number twos in case the number two got fired or whatever and there's only you know the number is only one, one number two per ship and the number one was on a few ships generally so anyway so this guy puts a cigarette out of my drink and then like orders his own drink and said hey i just want to tell you it's great to have an american on here we're going to have a hell of a time and in, in England, where I'm from, you know, uh, men, men, you know, start off a new career, start off a new journey together by cheering. And I had nothing but the drink <laughs> with a, c- a cigarette in it. And so I'm like. <laughs> so what did you do? I <laughs> clinked <laughs> and drank. Seems like it could have been some weird initiation ritual. Oh, maybe it was. Oh, because those guys were huge into torture. It was crazy. <laughs> But anyway, it was the d- most disgusting thing I've ever done. To have it to drink a drink with a cigarette butt is disgusting. That's really gross. Never do it. Never do it. 
But uh, yeah, they used to they used to torture me. They used to torture each other. They were they were vicious to each other. Pepper's in here. She's being so weird. They did things like I, I remember one time they took a one of their guys. They found a grocery cart at the top of a hill in in England. In sorry, in um in Bermuda. I think it must have been Southampton, Bermuda. The dog sorry is. What did she leave something here that yeah. she wants? She's burrowing under this table. She's found oh it's a ball. Well, there's a ball. Anyway, so they took this guy. They all were all drunk out one day, these young guys, all mm-hmm. number fives. And they took this guy out, the new number five, and they put him in a grocery cart, Alice. And Sorry, I'm distracted no, it's by okay. Pepper's At grabbing the top, the... Of this, top of this long hill. <laughs> What's wrong the top of this her? long hill. The dog is dr- – you should get the dog on camera for a second. Are you, I, allowed, are you able to I, do it? I don't want or Use my camera. Just tip it over to her. Do you mind? People want to see the dog. Don't get my legs. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get your legs. There's Pepper. There's Pepper. There's Pepper. Hi, Pepper. She found a tennis ball, which she yep. will now eat. Um, and it will be – I'll pick up a million pieces of tennis ball later. So So anyway, uh, so they get this other photog, these English guys, and they put him in the carriage at the top of this hill, Alice, and they just pushed him down the hill. It's a long hill in the middle of a city. To, that, to them, that was like fun jokes. They used to torture you, like get you twist your arm behind your back. We'd be in the dark room for to process color process photos. Mm-hmm. Boom, the room's completely dark. But those dudes would take the time to try to torture us, you know, sub um, inferior. What's it called? Officers? What's it called? Subversive? Sub? sub superior? Officer? No. What's the different? No, not sub. Inferior. Officer? Inferior, but there's a word in the military. You'd be uh, a uh, subordinate. Subordinate, exactly. So they, the two top <laughs> I love guys. when we play word guessing the, games. The two top guys would decide that they would torture me and the other guy, and mm-hmm. so they start to they turn off the lights to color process all the photos, which are on one big ribbon of cruise people. Yeah. And the room's totally dark, of course, and I just we just see their cigarette butts slowly walking towards us, the red the cherry on the cigarette butt making their way towards us to to torture us. It's vicious. Now that I think about it, actually, maybe I should have called the cops or anything. No, no, <laughs> it was awesome. Anyway, so so the point is. I saw um, Steel Magnolias 100 billion times. <laughs> you, you don't usually – back then, now you can you can watch stuff again and again. Back then, you didn't get to watch movies all the time right. on, uh, you know, on dry land. But I saw that a billion times. I could – front and back, I just knew that movie like nothing else. I saw Big with Tom Hanks again and again um. and again. I knew every scene. I knew every scene. <laughs> Few movies like that, so that's that one movie. So I'm glad you took this journey with me back into the late '80s, um, and now uh, that brings us to the guy who's getting the doing the get out the vote thing. So his name is Adrian El- Elliott. You can tell how important this Georgia election is to them. I don't think it looks very good. You never know. There's a um, a report came out today that showed that in fact in Georgia the vote for the black vote actually was down. Which means mm-hmm. Stacey Abrams did not pull off. You know, she had this huge get out the vote effort going, and she did not pull it off like it uh, like it happened last time, like what they needed. So, in mm-hmm. other words, this is this is, and I'll borrow from the commentary guys. This is um, wine moms and yoga pants in the suburbs, who uh, who are, are the the driving political force in uh, in Georgia. For mm-hmm. for de- the Democrats anyway, and the mo- most woke in the entire country, they're most woke. We talk about, um, you know, white people from uh, Wellesley all the time. Well, everybody has their Wellesley, and Georgia has more and more. Georgia's kind of uh, having a beautiful housing boom. Right. So, so it, we'll see what happens. I'm not. I would not be co- uh, confident. I would not be confident if I was a Democrat that. George, that they're going to get Georgia. In fact, that would be huge. Well, and that there is also a possibility that they knock off Leffler, who's sort of a flawed candidate. But I think Purdue is probably a tall order for mm-hmm. them to knock him out of there. I, seems tough. And, um, you know, you know Leffler because she went on Tucker's show. Remember when she went on Tucker's show to make excuses for why she sold off a bunch of stock? Mm-hmm. Right before the market crashed and bought like video conferencing company stock and stuff, um, which is super like I and she's also appointed. She's she was never elected, actually. So she's probably the weaker out of the two Republicans. But for them to control the Senate, they have to get both 
Plus, they have to somehow convince Joe Manchin to do stuff with them, which, you know, he's... I know technically he's a Democrat over there in West Virginia, but he's really not on board with most of their stuff. So, I I think the hope is gone for Democrats to do any of their really, really exciting items that they want to get done, like the Green New Deal and stuff. I, I don't see how that's in the cards for them. Yeah, and also there's a problem. We played the audio yesterday with... Um, Warnock. Yeah, Warnock has got a couple of problems, and um, needless to say, one of them is uh, a problem with um, with white people, <laughs> which we played yesterday, which is, you know, there's a time and place to uh, to be hating um, to be hating uh, white people. And I think right now, uh, th- when you're looking to when you're looking to win in a generally conservative state, that mm-hmm. uh, I don't know that that's a, uh, a winning formula. No matter what happens next month, more than a third of the nation that would go along with this is reason to be afraid. America needs to repent for its worship of whiteness on, on full display. So who knows? I don't think uh, – I wouldn't be optimistic. I can tell you that – so we're going to talk a little bit about the media changing. Hi, Sally. Hi. How can I help you? Oh, good. Good girl. Thank you. So the media is changing here locally in Boston. Um, the big news today is that Howie Carr's producer, our second chair, Grace Curley, who we've had on in the first couple of weeks, I think mm-hmm. I had her on, who's an awesome person. Grace it, Curley is now moving to Chaz. That was the name of the episode. Oh, is that true? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> hey, Grace Curley is a great talent and one of the nicest people in radio and uh, uh, she's she's got a thousand tools. She's got a knack for politics, and this um, contagious, you know, humor about politics. That for somebody who's twenty eight years old in a blue state, a young woman who's twenty eight years old mm-hmm. is just it's so rare. You just don't see it a lot. And Alice, you have it. And Grace Curley has it. And so Grace has this great gig down to in, in in Boston. Um, and that was the the spot that was, um, you know, what was the home of VB, who so, was also, also been on a couple. But times. my understanding is that she's doing it through the Howie Carr Radio Network. Well, right, and that it's not necessarily confirmed, although obviously, but it's not necessarily confirmed by RKO that they're going to be taking Grace in the twelve to three spot. Uh, I mean, no, I'm not saying that they won't take her because they will, obviously, but I'm saying that. I don't think RKO is saying, oh, good, look, we're replacing VB with Grace. I think Howie Carr Radio Network has announced that Grace Curley is going to be having a show that's from 12 to 3 that will be taken in syndication by places that want it. No, no, it's part, oh, okay. of, a big, it's part of a bigger Howie RKO, iHeart I deal. Oh, okay, because so I is, hadn't seen that. That's, yeah, okay. Howie announced it today. No, she's in there from 12 to 3. And how he'll be there from three to seven. If you're not from Massachusetts, and Howie Carr is the guy who's uh, who's been really the stalwart conservative reporter, anti big government, anti government waste, anti corruption guy um, for for forty almost fifty years in Massachusetts. And uh, he's got a very popular radio show as well. He's kind of like John. Um, who's the guy from the Chicago? This. It's the Sun Times, right? John Sand, John Strand, John. You know him, Alice? Fred. Uh, no. Uh, Fred Smurlis's cousin. John Strand? John. What's his name? You should be reading him anyway. John. Hold on. I don't know who you're talking about. I'll have this for you. Don't you worry about it. I'll just fill for a second. Yeah, well, speaking of Fred Smurlis, remember when I sat next to Fred Smurlis at the Republican caucus with my tiny baby who barfed on me during it and. Then he was in pictures, like, right by me. And you were like, you were sitting by Fred Smurlis? And I didn't know who it was. And I was like, who's I? Fred Smurlis should be. He played for the New York Giants. No, I'm sorry. For the Buffalo Bills. As a nose tackle, should be in the Hall of Fame. He's great. I'm thrilled that you met him, Alice. Yeah, so he was at the Republican caucuses with me in 2016 for the uh, uh, 5th Congressional District. And... um, 
we went and caucused. Uh, I assume he was there to caucus for Trump. I don't know. I didn't ask him who, say he, that's fair who to say. he was voting for. Uh, f- for you know whose delegates he was voting for in the caucus, but it was to send delegates to the RNC to the national convention was what it was for. But um, anyway, a fun event. I went there with a tiny baby. Uh, it was a good time. I drove a convoy of people from our town, Republicans. John Cass, Alice. John you're, Cass. Okay. You're free. You're free, Alice. So before you you're went done, through the, you're done hearing about my you went all the, my Republican friends that I drove to the before Republican. Before you went through was in the convoy, Alice. <laughs> Uh, John Cass is the guy I was talking mm-hmm. about. Um, anyway, uh, Howie's a, a, got a great show. And VB, of course, now has been supplanted uh, by somebody. VB got to start with Howie and has been supplanted by somebody who works from Howie. It never feels good. So uh, I wouldn't think if it was me, I'd be thrilled. But, yeah, I mean, that's how the business goes. Grace has got a gig to take, and they're very finite in talk radio. And... Uh, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll talk to VB. I talked to him tonight about it, so I'll hold off on any more commentary on that stuff. But he'll talk to us next week probably about it. But media is changing. I mean, there's a story. There are a bunch of stories about newspapers, about broadsheets and tabloids just tanking, tanking in circulation. It is mm-hmm. not looking good for a lot of for a lot of media. Certainly talk radio, AM talk radio is not here for the long haul. I think we all knew that was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, print newspapers are not living off the print model. Mm-hmm. Everybody's losing circulation, print circulation. So it's digital. This is also not breaking news. But, but the but problem is that digital, uh, even with the same amount of readership in digital that you had in print, it's not the same amount of revenue. Mm-hmm. You need way more readers online to get the kind of revenue that you had in print. No matter what model you're using, whether you're using subscription or whether you're using advertising or whatever. But, you know, it, the Internet, like Craigslist came and ate the classified section of right. newspapers. That was a big money maker <clears throat> for them. You know, and now Facebook Marketplace is mostly killed Craigslist. And is that true? Mm, it's certainly taking a big bite out of it but craigslist never made money off that stuff anyway so i'm not sure. only like very i specific did it for the, the rendezvous of, <laughs> only very specific types of craigslist transactions mm-hmm. were making money anyway but i i mean i don't know i see a lot more people using facebook marketplace and craigslist nowadays not that i mean it's, well there is do. a certain classless demographic out there that goes to craigslist free stuff and those people and i would never uh, associate myself with any of those <sighs> but those people can't get those things on Facebook, There's but free so now, so, so, so all of this stuff is transferring, like we said, is migrating over to other than you know, print newspapers still make money out of obituaries because obituaries are generally filled with older people, and older people still read about those, so there's still a market place for that. Mm-hmm. But so, so now you hear about it everywhere that that all of the power now is concentrated in Facebook, the communications and marketing marketplace is dominated by companies like Twitter. Certainly, Google now to find anything out in the in the web. Of course, you need Google, and Google decides what results you get. And of course, there's do, there's Google's uh, ad uh, wing. Which uh, is- yeah, which that this was the other thing I was going to say about the print newspapers is that once all the advertising moved online, it virtually all flows through Google, and Google's taking a piece that wasn't getting taken out when you were doing print advertising. And, you know, because Google's a private company, no one really knows exactly how much that piece is, you know. And and that's, a lot of people believe, one reason why there's so much less money to be made in digital advertising mm-hmm. for these companies is because a big chunk of it is going to Google. Yeah. Or Facebook ads or whoever. But m- primarily, most places are running all their ads through Google. And um, it's... Uh, it's not really a very healthy ecosystem in terms of the online advertising marketplace. Right. And these guys are hugely powerful now. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if, it, if we're at the point where they technically have a monopoly, but they are, hu- they are huge. Uh, I mean, they'd argue that they're competing with each other, but it, it, I don't think that's really true. I mean, there's no other Twitter. You know, there's no... And there, right. there's no other Google. Google essentially, I don't know exactly what percent of internet search flows through Google, but it's enormous. Right. And it's it's kind of like, you know, when you've got two 
two or three, you know, owners of the railroads 125 mm -hmm. years ago, and two or three, um, you know, steel makers for the rails. Yeah, you but know. it's more like if there was it's one a, steel company, right. one rail company, and like one, one coal company, or whatever. right? Because it's like they all do slightly different things. Right. Amazon doesn't replace Facebook. Like they try and get in on each other's stuff a little bit here and there. Like Twitter just rolled out their own version of Instagram Stories, which Instagram is Facebook now, and Instagram Stories was a copy of Snapchat to start with. But it's like so they try and like nibble at the edges, but they're really different things. Facebook is really a different animal from Google, is really a different animal from Amazon. Is mm -hmm. really and so, and it's not great that we are so so dependent on them to do anything, you know any. Like, media company has to be in all these places or they are out of luck, essentially. Right. I mean, right. We, look at the New York Post Twitter account got locked for two weeks this year because, I mean, Twitter was, didn't really have a reason in the end. Right. I it mean, was political messaging that ran afoul, as Jack Dorsey likes to say. They didn't like their news their story. Exactly. They, they didn't like the story. Meanwhile, they've run other stories, equivalent or more egregious, that should have run afoul of their policies, but were politically, you know, averse to where they are. Um, and so they pick and choose. Right. And so should such a huge carrier get to decide willy-nilly, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, what rates and what doesn't? Anyway, so Jack Dorsey was uh, hauled in front of Ted Cruz today, uh, in virtually, to talk about this stuff. I generally want to throw myself out of the window when I start seeing these back and forth between <laughs> between performative uh, congressmen and and these uh, these tech CEOs who none of them seem to be all right. None of them seem like they could operate socially <laughs> in a space. They seem like the kind of person who might grab cigarette butts from a movie theater, that kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the <laughs> internet guys are have shark eyes and don't know what's happening none of they're all a little bit simple in their own way <laughs> they might be geniuses in the in a the, in the different scale but person to person they don't really know what's going on and then you have these uh, politicians putting on a song and dance some of the politicians I like we're gonna play Ted Cruz I like him just fine um, I don't get really rid of the cameras right. take away the cameras well, he, out yes. of Congress but they don't, uh, these people don't need this Right. It's just posturing. When Twitter is editing and censoring and silencing the New York Post, the, four, the newspaper with the fourth highest circulation in the country, and Politico, one of the leading newspapers in the country, is Twitter behaving as a publisher when it's deciding what stories reporters are allowed to write and, and publish and what stories they're not? No, and that account was not suspended. Um, it fell afoul of the hacked materials policy. Um, we realized that there was an error in that policy and the enforcement. Uh, uh, hold hold on, I'm, I'm literally looking hours. at the tweet from Twitter that says your account has been locked. You're, you're telling me that this is not an that's accurate. A, that's a lock. That's a lock and can be unlocked when. That's a lock, not a oh. suspension. Oh, okay. And this is, and I, I, pro I think Dorsey, who does not seem to have a mind with nuance, probably <laughs> thinks that that an answer is okay. But we're dealing with somebody like Ted Cruz, who's a lawyer and a politician and a crafty guy. Mm -hmm. He's not going to allow that. You to leave I, I understand that you have the star chamber power. Your answer is always, well, once we silence you, we can choose to allow you to speak. So they go on. Cruz just keeps pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, putting it to this guy who does not really have uh, a, 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 the adequate ability to bat Cruz's uh, assaults away. Does voter fraud exist? I, I don't know for certain. <laughs> that's a coach. That's the legal team saying, okay, when Cruz asks you if voter fraud exists, <laughs> you are being set up, Jack. Jack, listen to us. Listen to us. You're being set up. That means he's going to try to uh, decapitate you in 30 seconds later. So be prepared. So does voter fraud exist? I don't know. Uh, are you an expert in voter fraud? No, I'm not. Well, why then is Twitter right now putting – purported warnings on virtually any statement about voter fraud. We're we're simply linking to a broader conversation so that people have more information. That is cute though. We're linking mm -hmm. to a broader conversation. So anytime I see something, you know, talking about uh, you know, for instance, it's some Antifa guy clocking a Trump supporter out of the blue 
and I want to retweet it. It says, wait, do you want to learn a little bit more about this maybe before you go ahead and do that willy-nilly? Mm-hmm. You know, the other way around, no. It's absolutely hate, and go ahead and retweet it. No, no, you're not. You put up a page that says, quote, voter fraud of any kind is exceedingly rare in the United States. That's not linking to a broader conversation. That's taking a disputed policy position. And you're a publisher when you're doing that. You're entitled to take a policy position, but you don't get to pretend you're not a publisher and get a special benefit under Section 230 as a result. That link is pointing to a broader conversation with tweets um, from publishers and and people all around the country. Did he say a proto-conversation? A broader conversation. Broader, okay. he said again. Mr. Dorsey, would the following statement violate Twitter's policies? Quote, absentee ballots remain the largest source of potential voter fraud. Uh, I imagine that we would label it so that people can have more context. In okay. H- how about this quote? Quote, third party organizations, candidates and political activists. Uh, voter fraud is particularly possible where, quote, third party organizations, candidates and political party activists are involved in, quote, handling absentee ballots. Would you flag that as potentially misleading? I don't, I don't, you know, know the specifics of how we might enforce that, but I imagine um, a lot of these would would uh, have a label pointing people to. A- okay, have you had enough of this? Would you like to say something about this? Because I can't go through much more of this. I mean, we get it. Twitter's enforcement policies are just, you know, trying to provide cover for the fact that Twitter doesn't want to be blamed for people saying things the left doesn't like on Twitter, you know, that, and, and Facebook has the same problem. All these places, people get upset that people get into QAnon conspiracy theories on Twitter, mm-hmm. you know, the type of people yeah, that Jack else, Dorsey- else, they get no, upset no. about smaller things than that. No, I know, but, uh, but this is like. I feel where the impetus comes from for like why they do this, right? Is like the type of people that Jack Dorsey wants to go to cocktail parties with don't like it that there's people out there hearing about QAnon and they're hearing about QAnon on a platform that Jack Dorsey makes. So they're going to him and saying, why do you allow this? You know, people that work in the company are saying, why are you allowing people to hear about this stuff? And then, but then they get mission creep. You know, like, first, mm-hmm. they don't want to allow people to hear about things that, like, definitely aren't true, like Trump saying he won the election when he didn't win the election, you know. And then, you know, they want people to hear that voter fraud can't possibly happen and there's no way that absentee ballots can be for- – I mean, so this is the thing is that all their policies are just trying to create a way that they can explain why – they're taking off the stuff that really they're just taking off because they want to take it off. So they're trying to thread a needle right. of building a policy after the fact and create, you know, post hoc justifications for what the the actions that they want to take, you know. And I mean, the, the post one boggles my mind because they were in a game of chicken with the New York Post for two weeks telling the Post essentially – we're not going to let you tweet until you take down this story we don't like. And eventually Twitter blinked. But they were dealing with a pretty prestigious organization. You might not like the post. I know it's a tabloid, blah, blah, blah. But, like, you know, this is a long standing, serious newspaper with serious people working at it and behind it. And, and, you know, they could have caved before Twitter caved here. It, it's really, for someone smaller, the the decision would really be, there was no way if you or I tweeted something and Twitter locked our account until we deleted it, there's no way you or I could fight it until they changed their mind. You can't, you right. have to be bi- so big that it's, it's really like, and it, it just shows how much they control the conversation, how much Twitter is you know how much people depend on twitter and how much control twitter has over who says what on the platform right and i think that the internal pressure they get you mentioned it is Mm -hmm. underestimated i think that probably they have these big sharing diet coke staff meetings all staff meetings and the Mm -hmm. staff is allowed to get whatever they want to off their chest and share their emotions and 
stream of woke consciousness uh, you know, conventions every right. Friday, and they tell them that they feel unsafe by having a lot of this content out there. And Dorsey speaks that language. Now, they've all adopted this. This is now overlaid into their uh, their prime mm-hmm. directive and into their It's the HR new religion post. on the right. left. So they have to listen to this horse from, from people. The same way that with James Damore wrote the thing with Google, and everybody got upset. It, it was people inside of Google who said, we don't feel safe with him around. He, he's, it's incredible what he's done. And I think the, the larger way that the external, the reason why external, external forces are so vociferously um, passionate that none of this, that mm-hmm. information that would uh, would benefit conservatives conservatives at all uh, get out and distributed widely is because you look at the evolution of the Trump original candidacy. Mm-hmm. It, in 2015, it was a joke. Everybody laughed. It was a joke. Mm-hmm. Even in 2016, for a little bit, it was a joke. Remember, Huffington Post would only put his stuff on the entertainment pages instead of mm-hmm. putting him on the politics pages. They said, no, he's a, it's Donald Trump. So, but they let him tweet his stupid tweets, and they laughed at his tweets, and his tweets were stupid, etc. And then, of course, they wake up that next morning after the election, and they said, oh, my God, what could have happened? It's <laughs> certainly not us. We know we're perfect. What could have happened to make seven, 63 million stupid people have voted for this Hitler? What could have happened? <laughs> oh, my God, that's what it is, is that we let him communicate to the stupids and since they have no good reason to want to like Trump, because even though they work for factory towns that have, where the factories closed and moved away, and they're being, you know, destroyed by opioid abuse, and there's no money in the town anymore, etc., that can't be their grievance. I mean, that's not important. What's important is climate change, and Trump probably convinced them not to care about climate change. And so, I mean, I think that, or it, maybe they're just racist. Well, yeah, that's they the see, other one. They see and black people getting ahead in America now, and it just makes them so upset right. deep it, inside that they were, they exactly, had a, and that's they why had a backlash. And that's they right, voted and that's why Trump. Trump Trump tweets stuff with stars in it because that's a that's a, a sheriff star is a star of David, uh, you know, reference uh, so that he can get the anti semites voting. Mm-hmm. All these dog whistles, you know, Hitler didn't use that many dog whistles. I found, I found <laughs> he said the word Jew a lot. I think. But you know this Hitler's is... well known pro Zionist policies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean like I don't know. It's he just... made himself clear. Your conversation well, you're Thompson. right. You would label them because you've taken the political position right now that voter fraud doesn't exist. I would note both of those quotes come from the Carter Baker Commission on Federal Election Re- Reform. That is Democratic President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker. I can't do it, t- Ted. I know. Can't go I anymore know. with you. you can... You're not a listening to congressional hearings Ugh. kind of guy. Depending. Depending. You like the Kavanaugh stuff. The Kavanaugh stuff was amazing. Oh, that was amazing. That was, that was anything Woo. like that that can be completely overlaid onto normal life, where you had people actually hating Brett Kavanaugh for <laughs> no reason, just because they wanted to. I they assigned like... him a personality that is this composite of everything <laughs> bad in the world. Yeah, I know what Kavanaugh Brett, figures. That's right. Ivy League, <laughs> drunk. I could see him raping people. Of course he ra- <laughs> Yes, he did rape people. That's right. As a matter of fact, he was running date rape gangs yes. with people and... Huh. And, and people like, had Michael Avenatti on as a serious person for months after that yes. until he was totally disgraced. He had to like be disbarred before CNN stopped having him on and talking about him like he's a presidential candidate. These are the people, Brian Stelter, all these people. These are the serious people that we're supposed to listen to about. Like, so I want to burn through a couple of audio things really quickly mm-hmm. because Gavin Newsom, who's a, another idiot, who's the governor of California. Who got to where he is by being the most progressive guy in California. He has now laid down a law. There's going to be everything's closed, 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 reclosed, reclosed. You're in trouble. You have to go back under water. You have to go. You can't, you know, surf again uh, off the coast of California or else we'll send the Navy in like we did last time and throw you in jail. All, <laughs> all this and he's not crazy. And, you know, no no large groups, no going to restaurants, no doing this, et cetera. Not shockingly, of course, uh, Gavin Newsom uh, has to. As he's telling people, by the way, you're being, you're all being punished for being bad because we're spiking again. So guess what's coming down the line? We also uh, are considering full disclosure, a little bit of a preview. Uh, oh, a preview. <laughs> That's fun. Guys Lucky us. Preview. Um, the notion of a curfew. Now, before you. A what? Few? <laughs> a curfew. 
That means you can't leave the house, in other words. Jump in terms of your mindset and whether that's a good idea or bad idea. Uh now, before you jump, in case you mindset, it's your mindset, <laughs> by the way. It's not that we're locking you in your house. Before you get jump and panic, because it, <laughs> in your mind, you might feel like we're making you go in the house or else we'll arrest you. Before you do that, let me explain. Uh, we are assessing that as well. Uh, I have. Just so you know, it's just front burner right now. So it's not that it's something that'll happen, but it's absolutely happening. Can I ask a question? Yes. Do you know what the logic is behind the curfew? Because I still have not gotten a clear answer. What What does the curfew do to prevent people from spreading COVID? Because then you stay in the house and you can't do bad things. You're being punished for like, doing bad things. Like what? What? What do people do after 9 p.m. that they can't do before 9 p.m.? So when you, because you're the cruel parent, Alice, when you make one of our kids, let's say James is bad, and you make him go mm -hmm. to his room, which okay. doesn't happen very often, for, he would have to go to his room. You know, usually it's a specific specific crime. Mm -hmm. But during the day, there's any number of crimes our seven-year-old does. Mm -hmm. Throwing trash in the ground, you know, drinking milk out of the bottle. You know, <laughs> That's true. Beating his brother up, which he doesn't do. You know, a, any number of things that he does. Mm -hmm. You know, he, James, our, all of our kids break about 180 laws per day. Okay. So the thing is, is that Newsom, mm -hmm. you're asking, like, what does it do specifically? It prevents us from doing the possible things, many things that us, the children, <laughs> will do. He knows that there's hundreds of ways where we could screw this up if we're allowed to leave the house. But what does. We could go into a. Into a political rally and cough on each other. We could go into a movie theater, or we could go into, we could hang out together at, at a dinner. We could, we cannot be left to our own devices. Mm -hmm. We need our governments to lock us in somewhere, or else we'll screw it up for everybody. And but these governors are working hard, and the health officials all around them are working hard, and the crazy, over animated, caffeined sign language people <laughs> are working way too hard for us to. For them to trust us to behave ourselves. We've proven one again and again that we can't be trusted. But, but I just I don't understand what difference what happens at nine that doesn't happen at eight. He'll make it eight. What are we gonna do? Don't we gonna try do him. Wrong? Don't try Okay, they, so but I guess I'm asking why not just lock everybody in the house twenty four seven? Why stop at a particular glad time? You asked day? That question. <laughs> this will be the Alice Shattuck uh, era of uh, lock in the uh, uh, hide in place <laughs> on my desk quite literally three studies from france germany and saudi arabia interestingly uh that have done jeez wonder how the saudis keep people inside <laughs> so i went out to get the paper and the good thing is they have the paper the bad thing is they cut off my hands so. <laughs> comprehensive studies on the efficacy of uh their strategies as it relates to curfews we know in the United States there are two. The Saudis have found a uh, constructive uh, way to make sure that the women don't step out of line. <laughs> we are looking into that. Two states in particular uh, that have uh, what, statewide what states? curfews of interest, at huh. least. In what state would be crazy enough to be having a curfew? And that's Massachusetts. Oh, well. <laughs> there you go. But the funny thing is, is the, Goose, the Newsom says this. At the same time, by the way, when you're in trouble for all the many mm -hmm. things you could possibly have done. Right. Even in liberal, crazy, progressive California, mm -hmm. word gets around. Even a progressive <laughs> gets a little sick of being told to go lay down and go inside <laughs> his house. And... Somebody sees something, and somebody communicates to somebody else, and eventually gets to the press. And then you have Gavin Newsom. If he's going to dictate now that we all have to go into our rooms mm -hmm. because we're bad, he's got to get something off his chest because the LA Times is about to do it for him. A few weeks ago, uh, I was asked to go to a friend's 50th birthday. Uh, my wife and I, a friend that I've known for almost 20 years. and uh, and Just so this was, by the way... <laughs> A more important friend to me than yours are to you. So let's... Or your family or... It, exactly. It's his 50th birthday. A friend that, mm -hmm. had, invite, well, put a lot of time and energy into his 50th birthday. Jesus. Now, what kind of person could you be in the peak of COVID resurgence to put a lot of time and energy into your 50th birthday in a public setting?
Seems to me you'd have to be the kind of person who felt like he could get away with it. It was in Napa, which was in the orange. Oh, <laughs> how beautiful is that? I assume that's a poor area of California. Yeah, that's or... not the, it's not in a, the auto parts store. <laughs> yeah, that's in a place, uh, a beautiful person's place. Status, <sighs> relatively loose compared to some other counties. Uh, it was So just so you know, the infringement you're about to hear about <laughs> is really minor. Remember what I've ticked off for you so far. 50th birthday. He put a lot of planning in. It's in Napa, wide open Napa. It's to be an outdoor uh, uh, restaurant. And we started the, well, the program started at 4 o'clock. It was one of those early reservations. I got there a little bit late at 4.30. Just so you know, I'm just, by the way, I'm so like you. <laughs> you know, I got there, it was 4 o'clock, right? Am I right with 4 o'clock being early, right? Everybody, right? <laughs> I get there. I'm a little bit late to the. We're all late to wet to birthday parties, right? So just work with me through this. This is just. Not, this is not not even worth your time. You can leave if you want. By the way, I'm just going to finish this up. Uh, and as soon as I sat down at uh, the larger table, I realized it was a little larger group uh, than I had anticipated, uh, and I made a bad mistake. You know, I had known Chad for over 20 years, and he's not the kind of guy. He even though he's been planning carefully his 50th birthday party in a public venue in the middle of COVID. It meant that much to him. I couldn't believe it. I do a short count here. The table seems really big. Instead of sitting down, uh, I should have stood up and walked back, got in my car, and drove back uh, to my house. But mostly, it was Chad's <laughs> awesome 50th birthday. I didn't see anybody around who would know anything. And... Who cares? Because I'm not going to change my life, alter my life. I'm not curfewed. I'm not stupid. I'm a really important progressive woke person. I'm Gavin Newsom. You're the ones who have the curfew because you're not me. Instead, I chose to sit there with my wife uh, and a number of other couples that were outside the house. Wow, how wholesome. I was there with my wife, by the way, the person I love. Okay. Mm -hmm. We were a little bit late. You've been late. You have a wife, <laughs> right? Person I love. And some other couples. Just people, these were just a number, of, they, it's not that there were 73 people, you know, it's that there were 35 couples and one single person there. Household. And you can quibble about the guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, but the spirit of what I'm preaching all the time. I love it. You can quibble about the guidelines. We can quibble about it. I oh, mean, am I allowed to quibble about the guidelines if the police show up at my door? But he doesn't can want I, you to. Can you I know quibble? What? He's, he's going to even, he's going to stop the, the argument right there. He's going to intercede right there. Okay. Because the spirit of the guidelines, regardless of the quibbling, and probably if you <laughs> did quibble long enough about the guidelines, you'd probably find him not guilty. But he don't, no, no. <laughs> he is such a stand-up guy that he's going to admit to you that, sure, on the if you did the mathematic the X's and O's of the thing, he'd probably be completely, uh, you know, without fault. But you know what? The spirit of it, regardless, he's going to fall on the sword. In the spirit of it, he could have done a better job. Uh, was contradicted, and I got to own that. And so I want to apologize to you uh, because I need to preach and practice, not just preach and not practice. And I've done my best to do that. Uh, yeah, and now that the most awesome 50th birthday party is <laughs> over, I'll probably do that as much as I can. Uh, we're all human. We Unless, of course... There's another occasion that's exceptional, like somebody's 50th birthday. That and, I've known a really long time. And he worked right. hard in the party. It's mostly couples. It is it is in Napa. It's, the best thing is, is that even though, even with all this stuff, you would say if you're afraid of getting or contracting and spreading the virus that you wouldn't go to Chad's birthday. You would yeah. just say, no, I'm not going out there. There's COVID out here. It could freaking kill me or I could, it mm -hmm. could, I could pass it on. You figure you just out of if it's that scary, then you want no part of it. Just stay in for Chad's birthday. I'll fall short sometimes. Uh, we've been out, and I think I'll fall short sometimes. Mm, Remember that. The classic. Remember that when he's mm -hmm. at Rudy's fortieth birthday a month from now, and he says, mm -hmm. "I told you last month that I'd fall short sometimes." I know you can quibble about what was right or wrong, but no, 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 I need to practice what I preach. Three times since, in fact, I know it's been three times because I remember all of those dinners very, very vividly uh, since February, just three times. Unless you have 
reporting that suggests otherwise, in which case I'm going out here again. Mm -hmm. uh, twice with my wife by myself outdoors, and then this one occasion uh, with a larger group, and there were just. I love the uh, the fact that when he when he goes and breaks the rules, there's already there's always a little piece of mitigating you know excuse mm -hmm. in there. But you know, yes, fine. I, I was with my out with my wife, though. I mean, come on. I mean, let's be sensible here. We can be out with our wives, right? Like, let's be sensible here. You can have your bar open so you don't have to. Your life isn't destroyed. That is not being. No, 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 no. My wife and I have to open our business so my wife and I <laughs> don't lose our house is not a thing. Him going to Napa for Chad's fiftieth, which he planned hard for with his wife. That is to be considered. Mm -hmm. Rigging incredible. Just a few extra people there uh, yep. than the spirit of what I am promoting. Uh, and so if you're going to minimize mixing, you gotta, you got to own up to that. So uh, I just want folks to wow. know that. Paid for our dinner. Uh, and we, uh, you know, we, we had an early dinner, but it didn't matter. Uh, paid for our dinner. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. That means he paid for his dinner because somebody saw somebody's camera and he's like, oh, crap. Go into uh, – to uh, been found about. I like the how, like, well, we have to admit that. So he's, like, using it as a teachable moment for us that we have to now practice his confessional public health religion to the, like, to Father Fauci. We have to confess our COVID sins to them. Like, yes, you know, once I was at the playground and I didn't wear a mask when I wasn't near anyone, you know? Like, we all have to own up to these things and really, like, take stock of ourselves and what we're doing to spread sin, I mean, the virus to each other right. in the world. Like, they, it's really, like, there's no religious vacuum. You know, people think that you can remove religion from the world, but people will find one, a new one to follow. Oh, my God. Like, and if you're if you're a good uh, progressive without an actual established religion, then you've got usually many religions. Oh, yeah. Almost you have uh, uh, anti-racism hmm. is an important religion that you have to make confessions in. You have to, you know, examine your whiteness and your privilege on a regular and genders, basis and exactly you have stuff about gender you have to examine how you've internalized the patriarchy now now we have like covid purity culture you have to like practice this stuff and make sure that you're you know you have to own up to your mistakes because we all make covid mistakes <laughs> you know no man is without sin in the uh, important religious task of preventing anybody from ever dying of a virus. Uh, I shouldn't have been there. I should have turned back around. And uh, so when that happens, you gotta you pay the price, but you also own the mistake, and you don't ever make it again. And you have my word on that. Instead of sitting down, uh, I should have stood up and walked back, got in my car, and drove back uh, to my house. Instead, I chose to sit there with my wife uh, and a number of other couples mm -hmm. that were outside the household. Does this not sound like a teenager making an apology for being at the wrong kind of party? Well, sure. And let's go. Like, th that's, it's exactly what it, it's absolutely like weird confessional purity culture that's taken a turn. Right. But also but the whole thing he's asking you to kind of, you know what, do me a solid in this one. Mm -hmm. I mean, wife. Chad, 50th, been working hard in this nap. Oh, come on. You get it. We, right? That said, if you have a graduation party w that's got six more people than it should, you can get fined 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't f wash. Oh, no. That, that does not wash. That nope. is no, you have to pay immediately. You have to be punished. The come on thing. That's, uh, you know, that's, he gets to do that. Ugh. We're running late, Alice, but you know what? We'll tease what we're going to do tomorrow here. Yesterday, Tucker said something, Tucker Carlson said something during his show, which is interesting. We've been talking about the media and media, the way it's changing. And mm -hmm. it's going to be, I think, even a year from now, look, it look vastly different. Certainly, um, the news organizations will look different. And you're not going to need a lot of what we've got now. And also, the models just won't work without Trump. You know, also, a lot of the models have run the course, and a lot of the models have, like we've said, been supplanted. But a lot, there, there have been rumors recently that, that, that Fox is going to be the first uh, place uh, to have a, a huge changeover. And I think it will to a large degree. But uh, and there were some rumors that, that Tucker might do something, including run for president. Or that maybe since he was still kind of a pro-Trump guy, that the Murdochs might uh, minimize him or try to purge him. 
-hmm. Anyway, he says it is absolutely not happening. Before we get to the next segment, a quick note about this show. Over the weekend, we got a lot of calls asking if we're leaving Fox News. Ironically, at that very moment, we are working on a project to expand the amount of reporting and analysis we do in this hour across other parts of the company. This show is not going anywhere. It's getting bigger. The people who run Fox News want more of it, not less, and we are grateful for that. We'll have specifics soon. But as always, thank you for your trust in us. We'll do our best to be worthy of it. Mm, okay, before we go, we will play Charlie Kirk. How about this? Can be interpreted as a... Charlie Kirk on Thanksgiving. The left has always hated Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving can be interpreted as a religious holiday if you believe in giving thanks to a creator. But they hate Thanksgiving because they believe there is nothing you should be thankful for in America. This is an awful place. It is cancerous, rotten to the core. Tear it all down. Burn it from within. Why would you be thankful? Instead, we need a revolution. Remember, as the Students for a Democratic Society radicals once wrote in the 1960s, they said, conflict is the origin of everything. What happens when you're thankful? By definition, you're less likely. Well, I can tell you this. We've got several left members of the family, and they all love Thanksgiving. I know. They, I think they, he's attributing a lot of stuff yeah. to the left here that's not necessary. Dial it back a little bit, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, they're fine. They like the food. They, they, they certainly think Columbus is – oh, wait, that's not Thanksgiving. That's not him, right? No. They certainly think that we it, that it the colonists a, uh, yeah. genocide, genocide of the, kind of the, uh, the Indians and all that stuff. But um, – I understand that young Republicans are young Republicans and...